even instruments that play way high up this frequency spectrum in terms of fundamentals, when they have a transient, when the note starts, they have usually quite a bit of subsonic energy to them. For instance, a snare drum that you hit can have a fundamental of 200 hertz and maybe some overtones, but when you hit it, it also displaces quite a bit of air and it gives this subsonic pulse. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream Bus Compressor with Mastering EQ or the VeriTube Recording Channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Wessel Oldheaton, who has been recording and mixing music since his teens, which has led him to a successful studio business with a diverse clientele from big-selling pop acts to classical orchestras and many indie bands. He typically works as a mixing and mastering engineer. However, he is also a lecturer in audio engineering at Utrecht University in the Arts in the Netherlands. He has also written many articles on audio engineering and music production. This led to Wessel writing a full-length book called Mixing with Impact. In this book, Wessel takes you from an introduction to mixing music through the various parts of the mixing process to help you get a better understanding of what mixing is and how it is important to the process of creating recorded music. What I really enjoy about Wessel's approach in Mixing with Impact is that in the book, he also digs into the physics of sound and the mechanics of the human ear as part of the teaching, as well as methods that we can use in our own mixes. So often we are inundated with mixing tricks and techniques as magic tricks for creating a great mix that we forget to study the basics of sound and how our human ears work and why we have a reaction to music at all. So I'm excited for us to learn more from Wessel about the science behind human hearing and the process of mixing music into something that we can really enjoy and dig into the methods that you can use in your own mixes. Please welcome Wessel Old Heaton to Recording Studio Rockstar's Wessel, are you ready to rock? I guess we'll soon find out, Lidge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, thank you from, for joining us from uh, all the way across the ocean there in Holland. Yeah, I'm uh, very happy to be a guest on the show. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, glad to have such a stage for, uh, for me to talk, because I, I, I do like to talk. That's good. See. <laughs> this is a good place to like to talk. Um, speaking of which, your your voice sounds great. I know you worked hard to set something up. Tell us about what you're using to record your voice right now. Yeah, this is uh, an uh, U47 replica, tears capsule, and then into a 1073 mic pre, and I think it's a pendulum tube compressor at the end. Nice, man. Well, so. it sounds great. <laughs> um, the 1073 Rockstars, if you're not familiar with it, is... Um, a Neve, or a Neve EQ um, 
Mike Pree, and it's just such a classic rock and roll sound. It, it does sound great on everything. Is it a, a real Neve, or do you have a um, some, no, you know, an uh, alternate? Um, if I, I have to spec, um, specify it, then it is a replica made by an uh, English company called AML. Uh, oh, cool. They do a great replica, actually, in 500 series and also a standalone box. And, uh, well, I've actually built these ones uh, myself. They do like a, it's almost like an IKEA kit. <laughs> no way. <laughs> complete with a manual and everything, uh, uh, or, or a paint by numbers sort of thing. It's uh, it's it's cool and it sounds great actually. I lose use them a lot during mixing. So this is a kit that we could get ourselves if we wanted to build our own 1073. Um, I'm, I can't speak for Colin, who who runs the company, because sometimes he um, he puts the 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 designs on the market as a kit first and then sells like a completely manufactured product. But mm -hmm. I, I, I do believe that the 1073 is still available as uh, as a kit. Very cool. And then what about the uh, 47 microphone that you're using? Who, who makes that one? Um, that's uh, made by Max Tiersch. Um, no, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Tiersch is capsule, Max Kircher. He's from Austria, and uh, well, he sometimes does small batches, and uh, he puts them on sale at uh, DIY forums. So cool, so cool. All right, well, Groovy, well, so um, we've done a little bit of an introduction for you. Uh, tell us where you're joining us from in Holland, and then um, tell us how you got started out in recording. Well, I'm actually uh, in the right place to tell you, because I've been in this place for, I think, almost 20 years now, so, so really since my teens. Uh, I've um, I've been terrible lucky uh, having parents who uh, have the space uh, to have a barn on their land. And uh, nice. that barn was sort of my um, uh, go-to refuge <laughs> as a teenager. It had my drum kit and later also a lot of friends in it. Uh, so, yeah, we had a lot of rehearsal sessions, uh, started playing in bands and also started recording at a very young age just by... Uh, using scrapped uh, hi-fi bits. Uh, you can't think too much of it now, but it's it's stuff like taping a, a hi-fi microphone to an acoustic guitar in an attempt to make it an electric guitar, stuff nice. like that. Nice, cool. That sounds like fun. So these are some of the benefits of growing up on a tulip farm in Holland? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess so, yeah, minus the tulips. <laughs> minus the tulips, all right. That's what I remember yeah. from my visits to Holland is driving around. You just see fields and fields of tulips. Yeah, it's yeah, beautiful. there's no lack of tulips. <laughs> no lack of tulips. All right, cool. That's a good uh, good theme for the uh, the podcast as well. So, um, Groovy, so you're recording at home and doing all that, and then I've seen pictures of your studio. Where is it now? Because you have a beautiful setup for for mixing and mastering. Well, it's still in that same barn. Um, I, I redecorated and, well, I did some serious reconstruction work as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I've maybe done three or four major reconstructions over the years. Um, but it just, it, it got out of hand. Uh, at first it was... <laughs> as, as studios do, right? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if, if all goes well, it, it does get out of hand. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, yeah, just in, in small little steps, uh, which I would also recommend anyone to do these days because um, I'm not sure about the U.S., but in Holland we see a lot of big studios uh, just go bankrupt uh, since yeah the market has changed in the, in the last 10 years. And uh, yeah, I feel it's only warranted uh, to, to buy a lot of gear if, if you have the work for it. And if you do it in small steps and just grow with each step, then, then you don't ever get caught up in uh, bank loans and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think uh, that's good advice. I, I mentioned that on here at times where I had a sort of an attitude shift where I realized that if I wanted to buy a new piece of gear for the studio, ultimately, I'm not the one buying it. It's it's somebody, it's a client that I work with. It's, you know, an artist that I'm working with. And when you think about it like that, it helps you make smarter decisions, I think. Yeah, I think so. Although I do mix the clients are up a bit so uh, it could be another client is paying for the equipment of another client true true so uh, like if you have a, a nice major gig then that could bring in some some decent cash and and i'll use it to spend on well just spending more time on an indie project for instance i, I do that a lot 
Yeah. Well, so tell us uh, what your studio looks like. What's how how is it laid out? Um, well, basically, I, I used to record here, but uh, now I don't anymore. I just uh, became specialized in, in well, the post-production part, so mixing and mastering. And um, I have so many clients now that, that just approach me for that. And I never made a conscious decision not to record anymore, but it just happened. Um, so now I've, I've changed the studio a bit. Uh, so the big room is just uh, a mixing mastering room. Um, and it's, um, yeah, what you would call a hybrid setup. So, uh, I, I don't have a desk anymore. Um, but I do have a desk just compiled out of lots of outboard gear and, and analog effects. Uh, I just like that way of working, but it's all, um, hooked up to a computer with a lot of, um, uh converter channels uh and it's 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 almost total recall in that way yeah. so i i can do like a a, a mix um and i have a template where I, I have stem tracks set up and i can just record everything in one go and still have the opportunity to change uh, balances later on ah you talked about that in your book too which we'll get into later but it's this idea of mastering sometimes starting from stems for a song rather than just a two-track mix. It, it has more to do um, with mixing, um, mixing itself than mastering from stems. So uh, what I do in, in mixing is that after a couple of hours, I'm just getting tired of hearing the same song over and over again. It doesn't matter if it's a very simple or a complex mix. It's still sort of a fixed time interval of, of maybe four hours and then I'm done with it. So yeah. I just hit record and I have all these uh, sounds that I came up with uh, just on separate tracks. And the only thing I need to recall if, if I uh, want to work on it uh, maybe the next week uh, is the master summing setup. Uh, I do sum everything together uh, at the end stage in, in uh, approximately four different buses. And I do have some very light uh, compression and, and, and coloration things uh, going on. Mm -hmm. but. To be honest, so let me tell you a secret, they're always in the same position. So I, I don't change anything. It's just, uh, I regard it as like uh, an instrument. I, I came up with that setup. It's also partly inspired by what you would um, know from guys like Michael Brower. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it, it's somewhat of a multi-bus uh, compression setup, but don't, uh, overthink the compression part. It's it's only compressing very lightly. So it's more yeah. uh, for me. It's more of a having having these different colors, and they. I call it in the book. I call it painting on a colored can canvas. So you can, if you send something to like the first bus, then then you can be sure that it fills the painting up to the edges. And if you send something to the second bus, then you can be sure that it fills up the painting, but doesn't attract that much attention. Oh, that's very it's, cool. It's, it's, it's these different colors, so to speak. Well, we should get deeper into that stuff, but let's keep uh, making sure we do an intro here. Um, let's see, what, what else do I want to know about your studio? How about your monitor setup? Anything you want to talk about the way you like to listen to everything in your setup to really make sure you're confident that you're getting a great mix and a great master? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's the most important part of the studio. Um, and I'm a believer in having a, the system to be as transparent as possible. Uh, I use like a, a, a system that is designed and built here in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, it's called uh, Grimm or Grimm, like um, the fairy tales of the brothers of Grimm. Oh, yeah. So it's a similar name. Yeah, so these Grimm speakers, they're like pretty special beasts, they they have uh, almost perfect impulse response, which means that if you would uh, snap your fingers or uh, clap your hands and play it back over these speakers, then uh, the low frequencies, the mid frequencies and the high frequencies all come out at exactly the same time and also decay in a similar manner. Uh, so wow. that makes these speakers uh, like very uh, clean and they go to great lengths to accomplish that. So the, the uh, subwoofer that uh, is part of the system is actually uh, using motional feedback. So it has a sensor to measure the excursion of the woofer. And if it starts to distort, the system auto-corrects. So it has built-in feedback uh, and it corrects the movement of the woofer. 
So you can actually play uh, a 30 hertz sine wave and hear no overtones on these speakers. Wow. So it's, it's the cleanest low end I know of. Wow, it almost sounded like you said emotional feedback. That's what I need, a speaker that, <laughs> that gets me excited about my mix. <laughs> yeah, well, th that's the thing. They do make it hard on you to get excited about anything because they're ruthless beasts. Ruthless uh, beasts, I love it. Yeah, I, 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 I did have like a struggle with them, uh, just getting getting used to them and, and, and trusting my instincts. But they've also learned... Uh, me to mix in a different way, which I uh, have come to enjoy quite a bit, and and I've I've started to use much more um, depth in my mixes. So much I, I rely much more on, on perspective now than I uh, I used to do, because um, these speakers just invite you to um, to use the available space because they they portray it so well. That's pretty wild. Um, now, what about so, the room treatment? Was that a big important part of this too? Yeah, that that's been an ongoing effort for for years and years. Um, I, st I I used to design studios for other people as well because I, I did have some acoustics uh, in in college. Um, so I, I do have some background in that. But um, in my own room, I just started out with like my best guess and 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 just put up treatment at all the obvious places. So getting rid of these early reflections. Uh, um, well, using a lot of um, rock wool, it's called in Europe. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you. Uh, same uh, thing here, yeah. Same, same thing there. Yeah. Um, uh, just making these DIY panels, um, and then doing measurements and and getting it uh, better and better and better. And now uh, the last couple of years, I've really gotten it to perfection, if I may say so myself. Um, yeah, let, let's. Uh, I want to. Uh, I want to give a shout out to to PSI Audio for that. Like, like sure. they they built uh, this bass trap. It's called um, Ava. Uh, so um, it's 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 like a, it looks like a subwoofer, but actually it is a device that is able to uh, actively cancel out low frequency energy. Oh, cool! Uh, and it is even more effective than its surface area, which is kind of a weird thing in, in terms of acoustics, because, you know, in acoustics, you need a bigger panel uh, to affect a larger surface area. But they came up with this device that, it, well, I, I may get a bit technical here and, and they can explain better than I can, but basically it lowers impedance uh, for these low frequencies. So it, it acts like a, sort of a vacuum cleaner. It sucks in uh, these low frequency waves and then cancels them uh, using a speaker in antiphase. Wow. So it, it's it's amazing. It's uh, I, I've put up five of these uh, devices in my my place, and it just makes adjustments in the in the low end so reliable and and well effortless. I used to struggle a lot with that. Low end is is the hardest part to get right. Yeah. And you know what it's like, I guess, uh, checking mixes in cars, checking mixes in your living room, checking mixes back in the studio uh, at different listening positions, and it constantly changes. Uh, and what I've noticed with these devices is that uh, the low end seems to stick to the speakers much better. So um, the room still isn't perfect. I'm, I think that's also good to say, like, any studio that you're gonna encounter doesn't have perfect acoustics, so they're always screwed a bit. The, these these wrinkles in the frequency response there just you can't prevent them. Mm -hmm. But what makes a great uh, space is that there is uh, enough distinction between the direct sound that the speaker is making and the reflections that the room is adding. And just by getting rid of these very early reflection parts, also in the low end using the the, the PSI devices, uh, it becomes easier to hear what the sound uh, from the speakers actually sounds like separately from the room acoustics. So uh, that's also due to the, the human brain. Like we are better uh, than a microphone at separating these two signals. Uh, right, because our brain interprets them all. That's why we can hear, there can be all this background noise, but we can focus on one thing. Exactly. It's it's exactly those mechanisms that are at play, uh, which has gotten me pretty f fascinated about how, how perception works. But that's a different story. But Well, how, uh, now, how big are these PSI boxes? You said you had five. Um, so it's, are they small that you can kind of put them in different locations? 
Yeah, they're like, uh, yeah, I'm going to go metric here, but half a meter high, something like that, maybe 60 centimeters. Okay. Uh, um, look like, uh, like a, a small uh, subwoofer or something like yeah, that. Yeah. They look like a, a, a wedge, a monitor wedge actually. Uh, oh. and you can, you can lay them down or put them straight up. Uh, will both work. Now, does it take up space, floor space in your studio where you can't put something else there or do you sort of put it right underneath the table? So it's in one corner where you get to use um, the space for two things. The acoustics dictate where they need to go. So you need to put them at, at high pressure points, usually in the corners behind the speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, and these corners, well, uh, I I don't ever go there and I don't have equipment there. So um, they're, they're not in the way. Okay, cool, cool. Um, well, so uh, Wessel, I'd like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote as we kick off the podcast, something to kind of get us excited about hitting the studio. Is there anything you want to share with us? Yeah, I thought about that. And... Um, it's 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 difficult to get it all in in one quote, but what I think is that <laughs> is that uh, having a vision of of what something could be. So when you hear a piece of music, uh, you use your imagination to come up with an image. Or uh, yeah, I don't know that many people that can actually think in sound. I I think in images a lot, but you you come up with an image of what it could be, and if that image is correct then that's 90% of the job for me. Yeah. You mentioned that somewhere in your book, I was as I was uh, going through it, there was this one image of a submarine representing a bridge, <laughs> for example. Maybe maybe you talk about that a little. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I take it... Uh, uh, I, I take it to the next level myself. Yeah, I, I write entire scripts in my head of what a mix sh should be. So I, I see it almost as um, well writing a scenario for a, for a fictional movie that that just plays in my head. But it helps me to uh, get a grip on all these different decisions because a mix is compiled of of thousands of decisions, and the way that they can ever tell a convincing story is uh, that they all should point in the same direction. So I, I need some sort of guidance to guide all these decisions. And I just use fictional stories for that, or sometimes emotions or connotations or can, can basically be anything. I think that's also, I mean, this is the way it works for me, but it would be hard for me to, to tell someone else that, that he or she should, should mix in that way. Uh, Cause I feel it's, it's very personal what you, feel when you hear music, uh, yeah. but you should definitely figure out a way to um, save that feeling and to use it as a tool. Because if you just feel it and then it flows away again, then you can't use it to base decisions on. So I'm, I'm very conscious of my feelings when I hear music and sometimes I write them down. Um, sometimes I make, make these mental maps of them. And I come back to them later in in the process. So if if you're mixing for three hours and and thinking, well, what does this bridge need? Um, then I go back to the script actually, and 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 figure out, um, yeah, what kind of atmosphere atmosphere did I envision for this part? And and am I there yet? Sometimes it's already working, and I I just look past it, and then it also well it anchors me, and prevents me from from messing up my own work. Yeah. Well, I imagine that that really works well when you're trying to be very creative with your mix and create new uh, a new expression for the song, as opposed to just balancing, you know, the levels of the instruments. You might be trying to create a, a, a whole new space for the bridge and you know, a place that it's going where you're really pulling out reverbs and and delays and trying to create yeah. a new atmosphere. Uh, that's true, but I do think that it also has an application in these more well, natural sounding scenarios, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then it can also serve as a means of communication. Like, well, I don't read a score and, and most of the music I work on isn't written in a score. Uh, but these musicians that, that are creating it, they do have a score in mind. They just don't write it down. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, definitely. So, so uh, even even the, the, something as obvious as, as a jazz trio, um, you, you, could, you could say, well, it's just the, the piano, bass and drums. So what are they going to do? Uh, change these instruments? No, they want to. They want to sound like it's all happening in the same room. 
but still they have a plan of uh, what the piece of music should convey in, in terms of energy, in terms of emotions, in terms of color. And, and it also develops in time. Uh, it has different stages where maybe uh, different instruments are more important than, than, than others. Um, and for me, it's important to know uh, these things because otherwise you're just fighting their ideas. Mm-hmm. And, and it's my job to make their ideas a reality. So I need to figure out what their goal is with, with that music. And, and just by talking uh, to them, sometimes more in a, in a more abstract way, um, it, it gives me a great sense of, of information on, on what they're after. Um, sometimes that's better than just literally saying it should be this or it should be that because that takes all the fun out of it and nobody can really predict that that is actually going to work. So, yeah, I I like to keep it vague, (laughs) to be honest. Yeah, Yeah, no, I think that's good. It's like me telling you a color blue, but that's different from me describing a day at the beach or a really bright sky or, you know, yeah, you know, deep ocean water. Um, exactly. Well, so that's that's some very cool stuff. Um, let's go ahead and, and jump right in and start uh, introducing your book because you've written this wonderful book. Tell us about the book that you've written and um, sort of introduce it to us. And then maybe we can jump in and, and start digging into some more questions. Yeah, cool. Um, well, let me start by explaining how, how the book came to be because I never envisioned myself to be a writer. Um, but I, I do see myself as as being a designer. So I think any mix engineer or any composer or, or anyone creating something is sort of a designer of an experience. And and in design, you learn by doing. So you need to create in order to learn something and in order to, uh, to also have growth. Um, And I'm the kind of guy that just likes to write stuff down uh, just to make it more comprehensible for myself. Um, So I I just started during mixing, I started drawing diagrams or writing stuff down that that, uh, struck me as uh, a a new finding. And uh, later that turned into articles and uh, well, people told me that, that they found these articles useful. And then it, it made me realize that it could perhaps be more than just a personal tool. So I started uh, writing more. And then at a certain stage, uh, I published these articles in, in a Dutch magazine. Mm-hmm. And then at, at a certain stage, I just met a publisher and uh, he, he had heard from somebody else that uh, I would have a book. And I told him, uh, no, I don't have a book. Um, and then he said, yeah, well, you should create one uh, out of what you already have. Um, and well, at first I, I wasn't sure, but then I, uh, I took it upon myself to, to write some more uh, in, in the course of a year. And then the book was, um, was done. Well, that's, yeah. a, that's a whole nother topic, really. Just the um, incredible journey of deciding to do something that any one of us has never done before, like writing a book and, and you know, going through that. Um, so that's pretty cool. I mean, I feel like making records can feel to many of us like writing a book if we've never done it before, too. You know, I just going through so. the process. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and and also the whole process of publishing it. I mean, I just work on records; I don't publish them. So it the, it made me realize what the artists I I work for uh, are going going through with these kind of processes. It's yeah, uh, yeah it's it's quite a thing. Well, so you have this book. It's called Mixing with Impact. Um, it's beautiful. I have a paperback right here in my hand. Um, great, great cover on this. I love the love the image too. It's like uh, it looks like deconstructed architecture. Yeah, um, that that yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, architecture in progress. Yes, exactly. So, um, give us a, a quick introduction to what we expect to find in the book, and then we'll we'll dig into the details. Um, yeah. I like to start at the beginning, and that is just by listening. Uh, so um, you, you noticed before in, in what we just talked about that, that I, um, I place great value in the monitoring environment, but I place even greater value in, uh, in my own ears and interpretation of, of what I'm hearing. And 
for me to to be able to do anything at all, uh, you have to be aware of, of of how the human ear works, just in in basic terms, so you don't um, well uh, run yourself into fatigue and uh, damage your ears, stuff like that. But also in in the smaller little details that can really um, mess with your head. Like uh, why does everything sound different every time you listen to it? It's just uh, it's 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 completely fluent the um, sound perception yeah it always changes um so that that's just what it is i mean you can't change that but it's that's, important to be aware of it i it's, think it's so true and it reminds me of a couple of times where that happens one is when i'm listening in the car and i'm driving if i just am not if i'm thinking about driving and i'm not thinking about making the record then when i listen i have all these immediate thoughts about the music and I'm always struggling to figure out a good way to write those down. Because I know if I listen again, I won't remember what those thoughts were necessarily. And the other is when you're in the studio and you've been listening to music all day long and you hear these strange things come out of the the mix or the speakers or you know some bizarre sound in there, you're like, what is that? And then, or you think it's a mistake and, and you eventually, you kind of have this rule that if you listen back to it again and you can't find it, then forget about it. Or if you can't show it to somebody easily, just let it go. Exactly. Like uh, the thing that bothers me most, actually, uh, is that you can um, create a mix in your head. So if I listen to an unmixed track for the first time, I'm bothered by, well, disbalances, uh, the music not uh, cutting through, stuff like that. Uh, but if I listen to that same uh, unmixed piece of music for 10 times, I've uh, sort of uh, detangled it in my head and I can now hear the music again. So I've made uh, a brain mix, so to speak. A I haven't changed mix, any yeah. anything on the audio. And and that that's just messed up because <laughs> if, if it works like that, then, then you'll never know when you're done. So I try to work as fast as possible. So I, I do spend like a, quite a lot of, and, and that's, well, a nice bridge to the next part of the book. Uh, the mix preparation is is a very large deal for me. So it uh, it's, it's so important to have an, an environment you can trust uh, to to build a template or or, a, or or use a mixing console or anything that's always laid out in the same manner. Um, it it has to feel like an well an instrument like a, a piano player can can just uh, with his eyes closed play D sharp right. and lower oct octave uh, and, but if you kept without, moving without the, any problem. If you kept moving the piano keys around on them, it would make it awfully hard for them to do that. Exactly. And uh, things like just having having gear or having, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, let me also say that loud and clear because I use this, this analog gear a lot, but uh, I don't care if it's analog gear or plugins. You can make it both work. Um, but in in the plugin world, I do find that a lot with my students. For instance, it it sort of um, you have to create the feeling of being at home yourself because you have you start out with all the possibilities there. Right. So I, I would advise anyone just to to buy one EQ that sounds the best you can find. Uh, maybe a couple of compressors, maybe maybe a couple of effects, and, and just leave it at that. And if you create a template out of that and, and find settings that work for particular uh, scenarios, then then you'll feel at home with them. And you can mix like a maniac. You can mix uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a song uh, in, in one go. Is that your next book, Mix Like a Maniac? Because I like that <laughs> title. Uh, keep it in mind. Uh, yeah, I have started on the next book, but that's another story. So it also reminds me of Rockstars. Um, this is something that one of the bands I worked with did years ago when we started to have too many plugins in our Pro Tools sessions. Is we just went through one day, and and you know the artist who I was co-producing with, he just he had certain plugins that he really liked, and he was like, let's just get rid of all the other ones that we're not using. And we would just put them in another folder. I mean, you can actually own a bunch of plugins, but have you know an unused plugins folder, which actually already exists for Pro Tools, and I and I think it may exist for other apps. And just drag, you know, close the session down, and then just drag plugins that you don't want to look at now into another folder. 
You still got them later. You could always bring them back in if you really want to experiment with them. But every time you open up your session, you'll you'll only have you know a handful of plugins visible to go for instead of being confused by a huge list. Exactly. And then I would add to that that you would also need to restrict yourself from just using uh, one instance of a particular plugin or on one source. So um, the, like like the analog gear, it's um, well, you run out of gear. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can't do any more processing and you can't do any more damage. And that's what I'm getting at. Um, I've, I've, it took me a while to learn uh, that one of the, I think, um, hallmarks of great engineering is minimalism. Yeah. Like if, if you can, uh, if you start a mix and you can find the, the, the couple of most important things in that mix and don't touch them at all, just have them like uh, they were recorded and and well i assume that they were recorded well uh, but it, if they sound good on their own just if, if you play them in solo and the, and there's nothing wrong with them uh, just leave them and and modify all the the other bits to, to make it fit and use as little eq as possible there's like so much damage you can do with with introducing all these phase shifts and uh, it, it took me a, a long while to to figure this out but i i've gravitated to using only these passive eqs and and only wideband um corrections except when there's like a, a a truly small band problem which is a rarity for me yeah interesting so yeah well it's an interesting thought too because it makes me think of plug-in options like um, universal audio for example they make wonderful plugins uh, and, and they use their own cards to process it, but you don't, you can't sort of put unlimited versions of those plugins on everything because you run out of processing at some point. And I like your point, which which suggests that that's actually a really good thing for your mix. Yeah, uh, I can't can't tell you how many mixes I've saved for people that just came to me with a laptop and and a session and and said, okay, before we go to mastering, what. Uh, would you do to improve the mix? And I would dive in and I would see like an Ableton session with uh, 12 plugins on a vocal. And what it does is it creates a, well, a remarkable bright sound. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it also makes the, the vocal um, uh, somewhat inaudible in a way. You, you can't uh, distinguish what is being said. You can't hear the lyrics anymore because the audio is being disintegrated. So there's so much um, phase shift, sample rate conversions going on in all these different plugin stages that at the end of the chain, uh, you lose all the signal integrity. Mm. And if I just took out all these plugins and then maybe used one EQ, maybe one compressor, and I, I could almost in any case get a better result than with these huge change of processing. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. To me, uh, I, I'm not one to to make hard rules because uh, if it works, then it works, and and I encourage people to be creative. I hope I, I do that with the book as well. I, and I'm never gonna say you, uh, tell you what to do. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna explain the things that I found out. And well, then I I think you do. And there was a really hilarious line, and uh, when I was flipping through, there was one part talking about creative ideas. And it started, your opening line was something like, you know, there are other ways to get creative other than just ripping a bong hit. And I just thought that was funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so not, not many people include the word bong, bong hit in their, uh, in their book. So I appreciate that you are very open-minded <laughs> about, you know, our approach yeah. to music. I'm from Holland. Uh, I'm from Holland. Yeah, of course. Um, well, great. So then, um, so mix prep, and then um, just, you know, again, sort of a quick overview. What are some of the other sections that we find in the book? Well, then we get to like the main mechanics of any mix. So it's uh, the, the, the balance between um, elements, and then it's uh, the frequency balance, uh, which is just a, a nuance on the overall balance. Um, and then there's dynamics, of course. Uh, so the way the signal levels change and how you can affect those. Um, and then there's depth um, and, and also a, a reverb and delay to modify depth. Nice. Uh, but I, I, in, in, 
I think in all these uh, themes, I, I go into um, how we perceive them. Um, and uh, l like, let me give you an example. Like a frequency balance is a, is a difficult thing because um, it's never the same. So uh, any piece of music requires a different frequency balance. So uh, I'm also not one to believe in these uh, intelligent EQs that in, uh, analyze big data and come up with, this is the frequency balance for hip hop or, or something right, like that. Right. Uh, the, the, they are being made uh, nowadays. Um, I just laugh when I see that because uh, to me, frequency balance is to a certain point, uh, uh, something you can influence creatively. So. You can see it as, as as giving a painting a particular color, but for a large extent, to a large extent, it is a, a, a consequence of how the music functions. So music has a particular tempo uh, and, and the pulse, it, if it's too heavy in weight, then the groove doesn't want to uh, move forward anymore. And if it's too light, then you don't have an anchor and you can't dance to it and everything feels sort of restless. Yeah. And and you can play with that. Uh, I mean, there's like a, uh, a margin where, where you, you have some freedom to, to shape it, uh, but there's also quite uh, a, a large part of the, the, the frequency balance is just dictated by the music. Um, so... Uh, I, I, I explain, uh, hopefully, <laughs> I explain in the book how you can just judge whether a frequency balance is working, yes or no. Because to me, that's the main thing. And if you're able to, to do so, and I just call it the head bobbing test. So you just bob your head along with the music and uh, you, you feel um, if it's easy to move with the music or if it feels sluggish or if you don't uh, get enough uh, pulse out of it. And that sort of makes deciding how much low end you should use much more easy and then once you know these mechanisms then then you can just uh, well go ballistics with with them uh, makes I, like I, a maniac I, <laughs> makes like a maniac yeah <laughs> no i think that's good and i appreciate anything where your guidance is to encourage people to trust themselves so trust your emotions trust your ears trust your feelings if you're supposed to be bouncing your head to this music because that's what style of music it is you know, then you know what it feels like to do that when you're listening to a great song, you know, or if you're supposed to sit back and just have a smile on your face or space out, you know, and it's ambient or whatever it is, create the listening experience so that you can really test your music in that environment, you know. Exactly. And I, I feel that is also important for, I'm going to get big here now, but for the future of, of recorded music, because if we all um, imitate one another, and, and are afraid to go by our own judgment of what is working for a particular piece of music, then you just create this average sounding, well, crap, to be honest. Right. Uh, yeah, and I can't distinguish certain songs from other songs because they've just been constructed based on what is the latest fashion in terms of sound. And, and, and to me, that's that's um, uh, a thought that, that doesn't fly because then you're focusing on the packaging and the contents. Uh, well, it trumps packaging for me. So, yeah. so I, I see you can package any song in, in the latest uh, hippest pitch shift vocal um, laden uh, treatment, uh, but it won't make it a better song. Yeah, and and, and just uh, using your your own <laughs> instincts and and not being too distracted by the world around you uh, makes better songs, I guess. Um, so I'm also one to uh, I never was very conscious of this, but uh, nowadays I, I really um, consciously tell people to leave their reference tracks out of my studio, uh, and hmm. and not to be cocky. But I, I just can't work in that way because it makes me totally insecure to listen all the to these other uh, bits of music. And as you know, a reference is only good for maybe one element or just to give you an idea of what kind of uh, style or, or context this music is meant for. Yeah. But it also contains thousands of other references and you have to think around those uh, when creating something new. Yeah. And I can't do that. I just get distracted and intimidated. It it just doesn't work for me. So 
Uh, well, you kind of created a reference with your environment, your studio itself. Yeah. You know, you created the, let the tools be your reference and, you know, these um, PSI bass traps, making sure that your low end is accurate, helps you have a sense of whether or not, you know, if you can trust that your low end is accurate, then, and you can sort of trust your emotion around whether you're not, you're feeling the low end and enjoying it, then you can begin to let that be your reference. Yeah, and you don't uh, worry about that aspect anymore because it's um, it also serves as as a distraction because because the amount of low end is also packaging. Uh, so right. I I just I trust the system, <laughs> I trust uh, the, the studio, and then I just go uh, with yeah what I feel actually, but that that wasn't too easy uh, uh, from the start because in in the beginning it's just a lot of struggling to get a mix to work in the first place. So I struggled so hard to make everything audible and, and uh, so you can he hear all the elements present in a mix that I just mixed it to death. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I EQ'd everything. Everything had a spot. And you see that a lot on, on tutorials as well, that, that there's this notion that the frequency spectrum uh, has to be divided in regions for each instrument, which is to also total bullcrap. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry separating about the swear words, by the way, but oh, it's quite I, right. I, I get um, agitated with some of these matters. <laughs> we we swear like a mother scratcher on uh, <laughs> um, recording studio rock stars, but um, you know, also uh, I agree with you. There's times where I've over separated the elements of a song, and it loses its emotional impact because some music is meant to sound like a band playing in the same room, not in a whole bunch of separate rooms. Yeah. And it's in the interaction of uh, the elements that you get music. And, and let me um, take it even further. If you uh, look into how perception works um, and how you form, well, they call it auditory streams of what is happening around you. So an auditory stream is a sound object. So basically, if you hear a bird flying around your head uh, and it's uh, located at different spots uh, every time, you can still hear, oh, that sound is from the same bird. Mm. And that can also uh, help you to distinguish what the bird is saying. Oh, well, of, of course, you don't speak bird, but you can still <laughs> you, you can still distinguish the pattern. Now, now is that it the speaking? Bird is, is it speaking Dutch bird or, or English bird? That's my <laughs> yeah, question. I'm I'm not quite sure, um, but <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, it's my fault. I brought the example up. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the the thing is, you can you can recognize the pattern that the bird is singing, and you can even imitate it. So um, the fact that the bird is one auditory stream is helping you to um, figure out what the bird is saying. Now, in music, there's like a similar thing that the elements form uh, a greater whole. So music isn't about just a kick drum. It isn't about just the vocal. So all these elements sort of have to interact, but if you choose to focus on one element as a listener, then you could hear a s sort of separate auditory stream of just the kick drum. And you could focus on the kick drum and then, then the kick drum in your brain would actually be turned up and the rest would be yeah. turned down. But um, the main uh, mistake you could make in mixing is uh, by making that process too easy. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's... Um, it's quite logical that, that people take that approach because usually the biggest struggle is to make everything audible in a mix. But if you take it too far and separate everything too much, then what happens is you can't put it in the same auditory stream anymore. So you now hear uh, two birds, basically, and they're yeah. singing um, uh, things that you don't relate to each other anymore. And that makes it difficult to uh, uh, hear things like timing and groove because you don't hear one pattern anymore. You hear a bass drum pattern and you hear a vocal rhythm. And these don't interact, they don't connect. And that sort of takes away a thing like uh, the groove of the entire piece of music. So th that's the way I look at it. So you should have you should have blend and some separation, but it's it's a balance uh, between these two. So cool. Well, hey, Rockstars, uh, we're going to take a break now and we'll come back in for the second half of the show and the jam session. Um, we'll see you in just a minute. A reminder that all the stuff we're talking about today with Wessel, you'll find that in the show notes. Also put together a wonderful YouTube playlist of some of his teaching. Um, and 
then if you're also just looking for some basic starting points on mixing too, and you just uh, want to, I do also have a free course called mixmasterbundle.com that just sort of walks you through using free plugins in any DAW, how to mix music, get downloadable multi-tracks to start mixing yourself. Um, but we'll be back in just a minute to talk more about mixing with impact with Wessel Old Heaton. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Wessel Oldheaton, and he has a wonderful new book called Mixing with Impact that we're talking about on Recording Studio Rockstars. Wessel, are you ready to jam? I am. Awesome, dude. Well, so one of the things um, that I think you were just talking about in Perception of Music um, but it was a title of one of your chapters, Everything is Relative. Do you have anything more that you want to say about uh, the importance of relativity in sound? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, the, the main, uh, it's it's actually a mechanism that is at play at all these um, core elements of a mix that I mentioned before. So uh, the frequency spectrum, the dynamics, and, and also the space. Um, and for each and every element goes that that if you have um, too little uh, relative uh, differences then uh, well a mix gets boring and it also works the other way um, so if you have too large relative distances then uh, a mix gets so extreme that it isn't uh, well you couldn't consider it to be a mix anymore uh, so so if I give the example of of depth um, I found out about a particular mechanism that really was intriguing to me, but um, you know how, how tempting it is to uh, record a vocal with a nice microphone uh, very close uh, and put it in a mix dead center bone dry. Mm -hmm. It just speaks to you in a, in a way like, like somebody is whispering in your ear. It's close. You can, yeah, it, it's, it's a powerful uh, sensation. But if you combine that with, uh, instruments that that surround such a vocal, I've noticed that um, the vocal, if it's bone dry and recorded up close, it sounds so close that it's sort of in my personal space as a listener. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you, you know the the feeling that if you meet somebody on the street and and uh, he or she asks you uh, a question but stands a little bit too close and is just talking straight <laughs> into your face, then yeah. you step you step back. It's it's also a bit uncomfortable. And um, if you step back and and try to get away from the close source, that the close source is getting a lot of priority from the brain. It's like the, an immediate thing. It, it has to be dealt with right away. It, it takes up all your attention and it makes you uh, disregard the background. And, and so I've noticed that in, in some of uh, also mixes I did, I made a lot of mistakes in that sense, um, that, that the vocal was so close that it didn't clash in terms of masking or uh, like uh, frequency clashes that, that you would expect with the rest of the instruments, but it clashed in terms of uh, relative distance. So the vocal was so close that I just couldn't hear the instruments behind it anymore. Hmm. And and that just led me uh, to believe that it's important to also, if you're creating something that isn't meant to sound realistic, just to respect the laws of nature, if, if you will. Like you're still creating a scenario that that is being perceived with two ears that are used to hearing sound in, in the world around us. So if you then 
um, set the story story up so that somebody is standing in your personal space singing to you, then the realistic scenario is that you can't perceive background anymore. And it works like that in, in, in recording as well for me. I think that makes perfect uh, sense. You know, I like your analogy of being at, you know, at a, at a event or something or a party and there's people and somebody's talking right in your face, it would be really hard to pay attention to what was going on in the next conversation over. Yeah, exactly. And I, I read this book by uh, a couple of cameramen and, and I got uh, a very, a quote that sort of stuck with me uh, was by a cameraman who did a lot of sci-fi movies. And, and he said, um, to be able to tell a completely unrealistic story, you have to respect uh, the way perception works, like uh, uh, shades and lighting, uh, stuff that we're used to. Also has to be at play outer space, for instance. Uh, if, mm. if you were to change up all these mechanisms as well, then you just wouldn't be able to tell a story anymore. People wouldn't comprehend it. So I, I feel that there's like these two things always at play. Like you have the job to tell a story in a way that people can comprehend, but then within that story, you can get really crazy and 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 sort of mess with their uh, sense of, of um, well, expectations and, and stuff like that. That's cool. Um, so, yeah, that, that um, yeah, that's something about relativity, but I could tell you a similar story about dynamics and, and EQ. Uh, well, sure, go ahead. If you've got something you want to share, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, an, an obvious thing, and maybe maybe it's good, because um, I'm, I'm also doing quite a lot of mastering, and, and the world has turned around a bit uh, in, in, in that sense, that loudness now isn't uh, such an issue anymore, because uh, I think you probably heard that all the streaming services are now normalizing their audio at uh, at lower levels, mm -hmm. uh, which means that you can basically uh, deliver almost any mix that you think sounds good uh, without worrying about uh, overall uh, volume. Uh, and it will work great on, on these uh, streaming platforms. So now there's also more uh, room uh, to think about dynamics. Uh, and... and uh, well, one of the things I like to do is, uh, well, th that's also a quote from the book, uh, without soft, there's no loud. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sure, you can use a lot of tricks to uh, make stuff louder. And I don't mean louder uh, in the absolute sense. So uh, for me, like like maximizing and peak limiting, they're uh, over. I don't use it anymore. Uh, but loudness in, in the sense of that it feels loud, that's something different. Like perceptionally loud, that's the powerful stuff. So it feels like some, some, something is played loud. You, and, and that's energy you even feel at a low level. So... Um, but still, you can you can try to make something perceptually loud by, for instance, using a bit of distortion, uh, uh, creating these bright high mid frequencies, making it a bit of uh, well, uh, have a, have an aggressive sound. But you can only take it so far, and people get tired from it. Uh, and yeah. also, if you uh, so it's also length, and, time length, right? If it's yeah, a short exactly. sound, it sounds quieter than if it's a long sound. Exactly. And if it's like a section of maybe 20 seconds that's very loud, it also takes you, um, well, maybe five or 10 seconds to recover from it. And then you accept uh, the new status quo, which may be uh, a lower level. So that is actually very hard to have dynamics in the first place in music because the step back is always, uh, uh, well, a difficult move to make. Uh, it's always a disappointment. And, uh, and so, let, let's explain why it is that distortion makes things louder. My my understanding is that it's it the distortion introduces much more harmonic complexity to the sound. So our ear just has a lot more details to listen to, essentially, right? Um, yeah, and it's or, also or our something brain that does. You, yeah, <laughs> the, the ear brain combination. Uh, it's also something that you really uh, associate with loudness because um, it. Uh, Distortion is not something that only uh, operates in the electronic domain. You you also uh, have it acoustically and mechanically. Mm -hmm. So uh, the vocal cords, for instance, if you, if you speak softly, uh, there's less stress on them and they generate less uh, overtones. Uh, 
um, the, if if you uh, stress them more, uh, you get uh, well sort of soft clipping of the waveform, hmm. and, and you get these uh, extra harmonics. So we also associate that kind of timbre, so that kind of a spectrum with a lot of har- dense harmonics with loud sound sources. Yeah, and so similar uh, things with strings and and drum skins. If if you stretch them out too far, they they start to well uh, acoustically clip. And and you get these brighter, uh, yeah. denser sounds. Yeah, but uh, I want to um, reinforce what you're saying. So it's a, such a great reminder that all these things we st- struggle to accomplish in music, they all come back to these basic, basic human features, you know, how the ear works, but things like um, what you just said. So the vocal cord stressing like that means that somebody's using a loud voice or the saber-toothed tiger is roaring at you. <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. and therefore, like the louder includes all this this uh, harmonic content from the voice, and therefore our brain has evolved to want to pay attention to that because it's a survival instinct among other things. So there's, you know, I think at the core, because like you know, the violin and the drum haven't been around long enough for our brains to um, evolve towards those things, but vocal cords certainly have. Exactly. So so all the acoustic elements in the world around you they they have been uh, around as long as we have uh, and 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 the sounds they make so yeah hitting something with a a, a blunt object uh, that also could be uh, a stone e- falling on your head in the, outside of the cave exactly and it would be a similar mechanism like uh, you would uh, you would build an association with that type of sound and and it stands for something so it has meaning and then you can think uh, when, when applying that that knowledge in in music production. You can think of um, well, just dosing um, that meaning. So so don't use it all in one go. Uh, don't don't uh, overdo it. It's just basic uh, arcs of tension that that you're creating. It's it's a similar thing. Like which is the more a scary movie? Like the the zombie slasher when there's scary things. Uh, all the time and blood flowing around and 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 it's a total mess. But you 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 sort of get numbed by it, or you get a movie that builds tension uh, for uh, maybe an hour and then something terrible happens. Yeah, uh, it's it's a totally um, uh, well different experience, I guess. It's all about storytelling. It's about storytelling. Yeah. Um, but another thought that that I was reminded of is uh, it's also uh, our hearing and are the importance of early reflections in a studio, for example. So the reflections that are coming from the left and the right and from over our head are more important than the reflections that are coming down off the floor. And that's just simply for the reason that, you know, we've evolved to be aware of being attacked from the left or the right or from, you know, a pterodactyl flying down on us. But rarely are we being attacked from something underneath us from from our feet up, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that that's uh, yeah. It's all these these mechanisms that are just built into uh, to humans that uh, that you have to deal with when when you create something for humans to to perceive. Yeah. So let's dig into some more of the human ear questions because you had some great things to share about the in the intro- introduction. So, for example, how is the human ear like a compressor? <laughs> Um, well, it, it is a compressor in, in a couple of different ways, and actually compressor with uh, different uh, timing constants as well. Uh, the main mechanism is that you always adjust to your uh, surroundings, and that's good to be aware of. It's it's a very similar thing as your pupil dilating uh, uh, in relationship to the amount of light being available. Mm-hmm. It's just about maximizing the, uh, the amount of information that you can perceive in a particular uh, circumstance. And um, it takes a bit of time because if the mechanism would um, adapt too fast to to new circumstances, then it would also adapt um, uh, when the music is playing. So a bass drum could be very loud, but then the next bar it could be very quiet. And if your uh, hearing threshold shifts the entire time uh, to to follow all these new uh, circumstances, that wouldn't make sense. So it has uh, a timing lag. 
uh, you know the feeling if you go to a concert and you uh, just step into the venue and it's a rock concert, then usually it's uh, the first 10 minutes are, are uh, loud. The first the uh, first one minute is me putting my foam earplugs deep into my ears. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, let's not get into that matter because it's, I don't know about the US, but in Holland, well, we do have rules, but it's still crazy. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm an earplug guy myself obviously when doing yeah. this kind of work um but it, the the first 10 minutes you you notice consciously that the sound is very loud and you hear um a different balance things tend to sound brighter and 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 you'd notice the uh, loudness more but then uh, the hearing threshold shifts uh, in relationship to these new circumstances if they last for over 10 minutes. Then uh, you, you notice that the sensation uh, sort of decreases and, and loud is a new normal, basically. Uh, and, and this applies to music, obviously, a, a great deal. If people get used to loud sounds and it's a new normal, then then what, what was medium loud is now the new quiet, of course. Yeah, right. So So it's all related. Um, so you do notice when, when leaving the concert uh, and you step outside that there's uh, this feeling of having a blanket over your head, that everything seems very quiet outside. And, and it could take much longer, actually, so maybe uh, half an hour before you get home and you hear um, uh, the crickets in the night again. And so it's um, in that sense, the, the, the ear is a compressor, um, but the ear is a compressor in a... Um, a more important sense for music, actually, because uh, because what you can get from this mechanism, uh, let me just finish this section, uh, is that you shouldn't change your uh, playback volume um, for very short intervals. Uh, so if if you put the speakers up loud for two minutes, then you get the sensation of wow, it's very loud, and and you get this whole um, sort of kick out of it, but it doesn't um, represent what it's like to listen to that music when loud is the new normal basically right, right. Interesting. so you, you sh I, I i tend to go by long holes with monitor volume so uh, uh I, I start out having it a bit louder and and really working on the low end making sure that that works mm -hmm. and then uh, i listen much softer and this is a technique a lot of mixers use. You can uh, you, you can find it in lots of interviews. But I think this is the reasoning behind it that the ear uh, just needs time to adjust. Yeah. And and then there's also something like you can have a particular uh, doses of sound uh, in a day without uh, getting overly tired or damaging your ears. Mm -hmm. And the doses burns up faster if you listen very loudly. Definitely. Uh, so, so listen loud for maybe half an hour, and then listen at medium level for for two hours. So, so yeah. something like that. In the book, there's like a table of what 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 I would recommend. And also, just a reminder, rock stars, that that loud listen, you know, dialing in the low end, you turn it down and you listen lower, and for the rest of that day, you're probably not going to have that clear sense that your low end is right. But hopefully you're able to trust that you said it right and that it's in a good place. And I find that I need to turn it up again loud later or the next day to check that it's still good because obviously I can screw it up along the way. Yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> uh, well, but, may, uh, may, maybe. Yeah, it, uh, oh. yeah, maybe just to add to that. It, yeah, it, sure. If you get it right at the first go, then it does uh, give me a sense of peace and quiet uh, when, when listening at a low level. It, I, it just takes away uh, problems. So you don't really hear the low end maybe as powerful as when you listen to it loudly. But if it's working, then you can still feel it's present at a, at a low level, feel its presence. Uh, and it doesn't uh, mask other things too much. And uh, so it, it just feels like there's a stable um, solid ground to build the mix on. And and so, you can also hopefully trust that you don't have to doubt the low end, and now you can focus on the things that you can hear clearly at low levels. And um, maybe just to touch on this too, but you talked about the importance or, or the uh, the danger of doubt. You didn't, yeah. you didn't call it that. Maybe you should have, maybe that should have been the chapter title. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the danger of doubt when you're mixing. Yeah, exactly. That that uh, doubt is the enemy of any mixer. Like uh, it's a strange thing because uh, people that that don't experience doubt uh, are 
maybe a bit narcissistic uh, <laughs> in in a particular way. But uh, so doubt can also be useful because uh, uh, I see the function of doubt uh, in trying to push yourself to uh, finding new uh, solutions, new ways to to uh, accomplish things and 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 keep on improving. But where doubt is a, a, a true danger is, is when you start doubting the system and you start doubting yourself. So this is also connected to what I said before about not having reference tracks, about having a space that you really know and, uh, and trust. And also that the system of that I don't touch uh, the, 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 uh, the bus compressor uh, devices that I'm using. It's just all set, so it reacts in a particular way, and I can trust that. Um, maybe it evolves, but that takes uh, maybe once a year I, I change a small thing to it. But, yeah. Uh, in, in between projects, never. It just it's the one constant factor that I have. So um, yeah, it, it's pointless because if I'm doubting that, that I'm doubting everything that I've done up up until that point, and then I, I may as well start over. Well, uh, I mean, that. if you if you're going to be a, a a builder and build a house, you know, and you keep changing how long a, a meter is, that's not going to help you very much. You know, you got to exactly. you got to have a reference yeah. and a benchmark. Well, so I'll also talk Wessel a little bit about the importance of the human ear as an EQ curve. And how that relates to you know listening at loud and vo- and quiet volumes. Well, to me, um, the most uh, obvious thing that that changes with um, uh, changing playback level is uh, well, obviously the the ear's frequency response. So you know these curves of equal loudness. You've probably seen them, the the Fletcherman's and curves, and they just show you that. Um, well, basically, at any level, you hear uh, a different frequency balance. But if you look at these curves uh, carefully, then you'll see that there is one frequency range where uh, the balance, the relative balance, doesn't change uh, with playback volume, and that's the mid-range. Yeah. So the mid-range balances stay pretty much constant at any uh, uh, um playback level. So that's why the mid-range is so important in getting mixes to translate well to um, situations where uh, music is being used like background music in living rooms or, God forbid, elevators. (laughs) And and in the other case, it could be, uh, well, played back um, uh, as interval music during a show uh, uh, over a big PA. So all of these cases need to be catered for, uh, and and while it's obviously also a mastering engineer's job to uh, take extra special care of that, it, it starts in the mix. So if you can make uh, a, a mix balance uh, feel powerful in the mid-range uh, and ha- feature all these different elements, um, then the low end and the high end usually isn't that hard anymore. A mix is therefore won or lost in the mid-range because the mid-range balances uh, are the one thing that you can rely on that will be um, uh, portrayed equally in all situations. So whether on a laptop speaker or or on a nice hi-fi system, on a big PA at, at, at loud levels, it will always feature roughly the same uh, mid-range balance. Uh, so I do spend a lot of time on, on getting that right. And um, well, one of the things is obviously you can you can mix on, on smaller speakers or you can just use a bandpass filter uh, on, on your monitor can bus. You, can you break it down a little bit? What would that bandpass filter look like if you were going to try that? Um, well, I would have, um, have it have not too steep uh, of a filter slope because uh, then you'll start hearing the filter artifacts more than, than uh, the benefits of just focusing on the mid-range. So maybe 6 or 12 dBs per octave. I think 12 will be fine. Yeah. And then uh, I'd start at roughly two 300 hertz, something like that. And I also roll off the top end above 8K. Because uh, then, well, you're basically getting rid of the bass and the treble part of the mix. And uh, you just focus on the mid-range and, and what you should listen for, because this will sound crappy, of course. I mean, it, it, it's not a pretty sound. 
but what you should focus on is whether uh, the energy of the music is still um, working in the way that, that you envisioned it. Yeah. So you still should feel the influence of the bass on the vocal, for instance. Um, and w once I learned about this, that's also when I found out the, the benefits of using um, bus compressors. Because bus compressors to me are um, one of the um, things you can d use to uh, translate all the elements in a mix to the mid-range. Because, well, let me give you an example. If something has a lot of low end, like a kick drum, and uh, it's an electronic kick drum, which mainly has a couple of sine wave components, real uh, low, and, and, and maybe only a short clicky attack sound. What you will hear in uh, the mid-range is usually just a clicky uh, attack sound, and it will sound more like a finger snap. Uh, so you don't get the sense that there's a bass drum playing when you hear such a mix on on a small speaker. Yeah. But what you can do with bus compression is that um, low frequency sounds uh, are powerful in terms of amplitude. So they they have relatively big amplitudes, and compressors react. Uh, quite fiercely to to low end if you don't filter side chains or do some st stuff to it. So um, what you can use the compressor for is just to react on the kick drum. And if you have a bus compressor that that holds a couple of instruments together and and the kick drum isn't audible in the mid range, but it's still modulating these other instruments on the pulse that it's playing, then you start correlating. Uh, the the ducking you hear in these other instruments with the clicky sound that you do hear from the bass drum and the bass drum will sound more uh, potent, uh, more powerful. So it has the ability to influence the other instruments in the mid range. Th that's a powerful thing. So if you get the hang of that, then then you can make all these elements influence one another, and then you can uh, get mixes. That translate even better, I guess. You know, I know that some bus compressors also have sidechain high pass filters, which can be pretty cool for allowing you to do some bus compression on your mix, but actually allow the low end to come through. But it's a good point that you make is being careful about where you set that or how much of it you use, because you may actually want that low end to affect the bus compressor so that you do hear it in the upper frequencies like that. Exactly. And this is also, and uh, I'm going to tell you another secret why I don't use multiband compression uh, on buses at all. Uh, I only use it as a problem solver uh, for things like vocals that, that change in timbre too much between different uh, takes or, or at different pitches. So yeah. sometimes you have a higher vocal and it gets shriller and, and, and if it's sung down low, then it's it's okay. And then a multiband can, can sort of... Um, lower that contrast a bit but if you think in terms of what a mix usually needs uh, then it's this interaction that i just talked about that that makes for a powerful thing and then let me get back to what the ear is in terms of a compressor you know the sensation if you hear uh, loud sounds then your ear uh, squeezes its muscles together it's a stapedius reflex um so uh, that's sort of a mechanical uh, fail safe for the ear, so it, it's it's a protection mechanism. Yes, unless the, you're drinking. Uh, unless you're drinking, yeah, and it's also always too late. So uh, it it, it uh, only if you anticipate on on a loud sound coming. So that's why a drummer isn't bothered as much by his own uh, snare drum hits uh, as somebody ah, standing next to it. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. It, it's it's a weird thing, but you, the stapedius reflex, um, obviously we're familiar with it uh, and we associate it with loud sound and it acts like a compressor. So if you uh, go to a concert, uh, record the PA mix and listen to the PA mix the next day, then you'll notice that it's way more dynamic than you would ever uh, imagine it to be uh, standing in the venue. Because in the venue, it's at such a loud level that your ear is compressing everything uh, like a bus compressor. This is something that, that you can use in music production. Uh, and I feel that it's one of the reasons, because I, I can name like 10 reasons why bus compression has use. Uh, but one of the reasons is that you associate the squeezing of sound jointly 
with loud sound and with excitement and power. So uh, that's why uh, bus compression is such a great way to still have the sense of loudness uh, when you play uh, a mix at, at a low uh, playback level. And, and, and this is, yeah, it's, it's very important to make a distinction between limiting and compression because the ear also doesn't have uh, an uh, attack time of uh, minus infinity. It's, <laughs> um, it, 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 it has, uh, you, I'm not sure. I mean, I, uh, it's no uh, scientific claim that I'm going to make here, but to me, it feels more like 20 milliseconds on the most compressors. It's, it's, it's a bit slower, the, sen the sensation you're after. And it's also not squashing it to death. It's just slowly breathing and pumping with the music. So whenever I talk about bus compression, I talk about only a couple of dB or, or sometimes just one dB or half a dB or sometimes the meter even uh, not moving because the meter is, um, but it's still compressing, but a meter isn't always displaying it correctly. Uh, so it's, it's very tiny amounts. And now let me get back to where I started because uh, I, I know I, I, I'm, I'm taking quite a detour here. Oh, sorry. Uh, but the, <laughs> the, the, the multiband compressor. Um, what you get when you put that on a mix is that take the same example of the loud kick drum. What happens is that the kick drum has all its energy, uh, its high uh, level energy in the low frequencies. It triggers the low band of the compressor. So all the instruments that have their energies higher up aren't affected as much. And, and that's why people call it, yeah, it sounds more transparent. But to me, it sounds much less exciting and it sort of uh, takes away all the contrast in, in music. Um, so, yeah, uh, again, I don't want to make a hard rule because I do uh, use multiband compression on, on, on lots of occasions, but then only when the contrasts are too great. Right. And when a, when a mix is almost done, then, then usually the contrasts aren't. Uh, too great. You you usually want to enhance what is already there, and yeah. and uh, a full band bus compressor does a does a much better job at that. Well, I, I find multi band useful on a vocal when I am just doing a really shitty job of getting the vocal to sound good, and it's too harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I find it's helpful yeah. there, and I have used a multi band when mastering, you know, my my own records um, at times where again. Uh, for example, with my band, we had done live to two track stuff and there was nothing to be done about the mix, but it was a harshness to it. And it did it did a nice job of toning down, you know, reining in some of the the mid range mid range aggression. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you if you need to change the balance, then of course it it does a great job. Uh, but if the balance is fine and you just need to gel everything together, then uh, it's it's usually a uh, less than optimal choice. Very cool. All right. Well, so now how about starting out with a new mix? Um, what would you like to talk about gain structure or gain staging when you're getting ready to mix? Um, I feel it's um, a subject that's getting more and more lost when, when, when people are working in floating point DAWs. So uh, or clipping, if you use the right plugins, then, then clipping isn't possible anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just uh, an infinite amount of headroom. Um, but still, it makes sense to uh, set up decent gain structure because uh, a lot of plugins that people are using are, are emulations of analog devices. And what makes these plugins tick is that they just don't emulate only the, the dynamic behavior or um, the uh, frequency response, uh, but also the non-linearities. So, uh, well, dynamic behavior is non-linearity, but um, uh, I mean harmonic distortion and stuff like that. Yeah. And you, you have a certain sweet spot for these plugins where they sound best. Like like if we use an 1176, then we also find that sweet spot where you just saturate the transformer a bit and, and it, it, it just starts to sing. And, and, and you know, okay, this is like a relatively small area where it sounds good. And, and if I take it a step further, then it sounds uh, flat and dull and uh, uh, just uh, um, boring. And if uh, I go below then it does, just doesn't sound as powerful. And, I, think, and that, I think an easy analogy, too, for, for the rock stars, um, if, if you're a guitar player and you play an electric guitar through an amp, then you totally get it. Like, there's, you turn the amp or the distortion up to the point where you're like, ooh, I really like it there. But if you, 
if it's too quiet, you, your amp doesn't feel good. And if it's too much, then it's just too too much saturation. It's too distorted and it doesn't have the expression. Exactly. Like the, uh, uh, there's an excellent example, like guitar players are just manipulating gain structure. I mean, with booster pedals and stuff like that, it's just like, uh, how hard am I going to hit the preamp or how hard am I going to hit the, the power stage, power yeah. amp stage, uh, s- stuff like that. And in mixing, uh, it's a similar thing. Um, I try not to record at too um, high level. Uh, I feel that if you record in, in 24 bits, then there's no point in, in nailing a converter uh, uh, until the red light is almost blinking. Um, and that also makes that if you put a lot of sound together, obviously you'll you'll end up with a louder sound. So all these uh, separate tracks uh, are going to add up. And if you record everything near zero, then... Um, your mix bus is is obviously uh, uh, gonna gonna clip quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So if you record everything, so uh, well peaks are at minus ten uh, dBFS, for instance, uh, then usually you'll end up in a spot where the fader in the mix can be around uh, unity, and it gives you maximum resolution of your fader. Because mm-hmm. well, you know, if you turn down a fader, that then like half a centimeter is is five dB, while the same half a centimeter is maybe two dB uh, at the top point of the uh, fader. Right, right. So th- that's the more of an uh, ergonomics thing, um, but I, I do feel that it's important to get that right. And then, um, yeah, in terms of gain structure, I I do like to mix. Uh, through these buses that add a particular type of coloration and and you wouldn't believe it but the system is like universally applicable so i mix very heavy music through it but i also do like very open sounding uh, more jazzy type of records and and sometimes even classical um and for me it's just a matter of using that gain structure uh, to get the music to the point where it sings and and for the heavier music you just intuitively start pushing faders more and the system starts objecting more to the, the, the high signal levels and you'll notice that there's um, sort of a, a roundness and a, and a, and a, and a flatness uh, getting into the sound but that that could enhance the feeling of the particular music that you're working on and if I do the, the open jazz sounding uh, stuff then I just intuitively keep the faders lower it just doesn't feel right to push them push him up further anymore so I like that sort of reactiveness that that uh, a mixing system can can have. Now, it would you, you would you be adjusting your volume, your playback volume, like if the jazz, your faders are down lower, but you might turn up the speakers a tiny bit more, or the with the rock, you turn the speakers down a tiny bit more? Uh, yeah, and I also use the loudness meter in conjunction. So um, there's a lot said about playback levels and, and what you should monitor at, uh, like the, the 85 dBs or in smaller rooms, you maybe 82 dBs. And uh, there's like um, norms for that. I don't tend to go by uh, the norm actually, but I do tend to go by uh, using a, a LUFS meter. Uh, and, and nowadays the um, level in, in Spotify is, is minus 14 uh, and Tidal as well. And I just keep that as a, as a guideline. And then I have my playback volume and I know that if it's at minus five I know and the meter is reading uh, minus 14 loves I know that the mix should feel powerful nice no matter what kind of music uh, so I, I have a reference of what the low end could be like of, of, of if something needs to be very bright then it does need to feel like it's um, well not tearing your ears off but it does need to feel very bright so you do have a reference of um uh, a fixed playback volume and uh, the the loves meter, and what it tells me is that if I'm not feeling it, and the loves meter is reading uh, minus fourteen, and my playback volume is at the right level, then I must be wasting energy in the mix. Then usually there's some problems going on that um, sort of keep the music from breathing, or sometimes there's a lot of low frequency energy that you don't really consciously notice, but the bus compressor is getting um, fed up with it and 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 it's pushing it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so 
that's why also a system that reacts to the music tells you a great deal. If you know what you expect from the system and it doesn't do it, then you, you should get looking uh, what what is uh, the, the yeah, looking into what what the cause could be. Now, you've clearly arrived at an understanding of the the minus fourteen Luffs meter, your volume knob settings, you know your SPL in the room. Um, and these are all things that people can do. It probably took you a while to get there, I imagine. Do you have any advice for people about sort of how do I get from here to the point where I'm confident about what's going on in my room? Um, let me think about it. The way I learned it, um, I had like a, b a bit of a strange career, I think, because most people start mastering at, um, well, at a later age. I sort of uh, started with recording and mixing, but then got an internship at a mastering studio. And I just sat next to the engineer and listened for about a year. Um, and I hardly got to do any work in that time because it's high responsible uh, work. If you, if you do mastering, you take the full responsibility that somebody's record is reaching its full potential. So it's no beginner's job. Uh, but I do, did learn a great deal from uh, listening next to a, a, a seasoned professional. Hi Zele, he was called. Um, that sort of... Um, made my ways uh, as a mixer uh, much more methodical. So I'm I'm always comparing uh, whether what I'm doing is Im an improvement to the music. And uh, to do a fair comparison, you have to match loudness levels. Uh, that's lesson number one. So if I play you a, a mix now, and uh, if I then play you a, a mix that's 0.3 dBs louder, and I'll tell you, Oh, listen to the extra depth in the stereo image and listen to this uh, well, enhancement that is going on. Mm -hmm. Then you'll hear all these magical qualities appear. And the only thing that's happened is that it's 0.3 dBs louder. <laughs> and, 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 and that's uh, b besides me doing the psychological trick of, of priming you and telling you what to listen for, because that will change perception also. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do audio comparisons. That's, that's why there's also so many bullshit going around people that don't test it but i mean they're right in the sense that they do hear a difference but sometimes it's also because you tell yourself to look for a difference and right. then you'll hear you'll right. hear it um okay but besides that whole <laughs> whole matter uh what my advice would be is with anything you do just um make comparisons and um, um if if you apply a particular bit of processing, compensate the output level. And there's so many plugin manufacturers that just boost the output level by two dB. So if you insert their plugin, you think that it's better. I, I've, that's that's marketing bullshit, of course. You have to be on top of that and and just make sure that that what you're hearing is actually an improvement to to the signal. So without any loudness differences. And once you get the hang of that, then it becomes easier to to make all these judgments. Because uh, right. there's a lot of judgments to be made. And and what you don't yeah. Well you, and the funny just, thing is we're pretty we start out being pretty good at judgments because it's the first thing we learn how to do. First we learn how to be really critical about whether we think something's great or sucks, you know, and music that we listen yeah. to. It's just the process of learning how to actually manipulate it so that it becomes great if it sucks that's that's a skill set you know yeah exactly and uh, that that's put beautifully uh, i think what you just said and so to add on that i i think you should be able to zoom in and zoom out as 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 a mixer so you should be uh that's able hard to, to do <laughs> to focus on 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 these little details is very hard to do uh, so i i think what people use a lot of tricks to zoom out. So th that's one of my main uses for these uh, different sets of speakers or uh, just, um, I like having people in the studio and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and just talking, getting distracted uh, and then listening uh, again. And um, I try to be as quick as possible in, in, in the doing of the actual work. So there's more time to, well, relax and get distracted basically. Yeah. Well, and I like to have another person to rely on as my zoom out. It doesn't always work, but, you know, I love it when somebody walks into the studio with fresh ears and they give a first reaction to something. I, I find that very valuable. 
Um, sometimes you don't like it because they tell you you're doing something wrong. Usually they do, <laughs> but sometimes yeah. they tell you you're doing something really right, which is nice. Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it to me it's very welcome in 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 a process where where everything is um, still to be decided. It, it's just good to have somebody uh, give you an honest reaction, and uh, especially if people don't try to put it in your words or what right. they assume to be your words. So I'm not good with uh, interpreting the "oh, there's too much 200 hertz" uh, quote right. unless I know it's coming from an engineer who really knows what it means. Yeah. Uh, but I, if if people just I look at body language and and the way a band is uh, in the couch uh, just uh, enjoying their own song if I play it on on some a set of hi-fi speakers for them and and if if you notice the uh, enthusiasm then then you're um, also feeling more confident that that you're on the right track yourself yeah that and, right, and that the other sense. and the other way around if I uh, sometimes people can be scared because they they can see you as sort of the expert in in the spaceship who's going to make everything work and then they become a bit scared to to tell you something that they feel about their own music uh that they don't like or that they don't think is working and i feel that that's like a very uh, big problem for me so i i really do my best to lower these uh, barriers a bit so that they feel that it's easy to talk to me uh, about yeah. anything and that they don't need to uh uh, put it in a particular lingo, so so I'll uh, I can make sense of it. It, it. Just use your own words, and and uh, and that will do fine. I try to remind um, the people I'm working with that I have no idea what I'm doing, but we'll get there if we just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so let's see. Let's let me ask you this question uh, about low end. So when we're in studios where we don't have the PSI bass traps, and it's not totally dialed in, and we don't have the incredible uh, grim speakers yet, but we still, believe it or not, we still want to get our low end right. What are some of the tricks for zooming out and checking your low end to to, uh, to, get, have, to get there? I have a couple of tricks. Uh, one is don't touch it. So if I'm not sure what I'm hearing in a particular studio, I just make uh, a balance without EQing too much low end. Uh, mm -hmm. And and usually there's if it's recorded well or if you use a, a sound from a, a particular synth or a library and and you have a reason to have it uh, play in a particular octave, then it makes sense that it has low end, um, and uh, it it has to be well it has to be recorded uh, in in a less than optimal way to for it to be off. Like if you you record a bass guitar uh, with the DI, then usually it it has a pretty even frequency balance, unless the the elements aren't uh, adjusted well or the player is uh, uh, hitting uh, one string uh, harder than the other. I mean that that could happen, of course. But then even still with a bit of compression, you usually even out these differences a bit. So it's not an acoustical um, uh, defect. Bass amps or or, or um, uh, Stand-up basses can be more difficult because they interact with the room so much, and you can have standing waves and, yeah. and a lot of interference. And and then that that's where EQ comes in to to correct some of that. That's just not possible to to do if you're not um, hearing it right. But uh, what I do is I tend not to touch the low end too much uh, in in those cases, and uh, I just make a, a balance with just using faders and not too much EQ. Mm -hmm. That that. Uh, that gets me there, uh, and then I just use a tiny bit of EQ to 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 finalize things. And this would be the case if I'm doing a recording and and and, and the artist wants a rough mix at the end of the day, and I'm just I'm I'm more busy with not messing it up uh, than with making decisions that I'm not sure about. And and then there's another thing. Um, I'm very careful with using high pass filters. I barely ever use them. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's also something that you don't hear that often. But I've found that um, any instrument, even instruments that play way high up the sp uh, frequency spectrum in terms of fundamentals, when they uh, uh, have a transient, so when when the note starts, they have uh, usually quite a bit of subsonic energy to them. So, uh, for instance, a, a snare drum that you hit 
can have a fundamental of 200 hertz and maybe some overtones. And uh, But when you hit it, it also displaces quite a bit of air and it gives this uh, subsonic pulse. And when you hear it and, and record it, it makes the instrument sound as big as it is in, re in reality. So I, I also like microphones that have a really good uh, sub-low frequency response. So so true pressure microphones, for instance, like uh, omnidirectional microphones. Even for um, snare drum, do you use an omni for your snare drum or do you find yourself using the typical SM57? I use uh, omnis for the entire kit. Uh, and uh, the the most of the mixes, uh, and I do believe that you have some of my mixes on uh, fr from uh, YouTube, um, most of these mixes um, don't use any close mics on the drums. So they're just uh, usually a pair of Coles ribbons, which mm -hmm. are semi-close, semi and, right. uh, and some omnidirectional uh, room mics. And these room mics, they extend the low end. So that, that's what makes you feel the air in, in between the drum hits, basically. Yeah. It, it, it's, it gives you the feeling of being there. And I have this, this notion of, of close mic um, recordings that a lot of them suffer from one obviously proximity effect because people use cardio microphones to for instance record uh, electric guitar cabinets and, and all, all kinds of stuff but the electric guitar cabinets are a good example because they, they put the microphone straight up to the grill and a cardio will give you a lot of proximity effect so it boosts the low end and what you think is oh there's too much low end so let me take it out and mm -hmm. you, you use a high pass filter and you take out the low end and the guitar st uh, starts to sound shrill and, and small and harsh. Um, what I found is that most of these dynamic microphones, they roll off below a particular uh, frequency because their diaphragm is voiced at a particular cutoff frequency. So, so for instance, some of these ribbon mics, uh, they're tuned to maybe 70 hertz and then they roll off. Mm -hmm. And if they have proximity effect, uh, obviously, the low end is boosted, but they still roll off below 70. So what I tend to do to correct it is use the uh, the, the pull tech trick. So uh, people know the pull tech trick, I guess. Uh, it's it's when you use um, an EQ that has a low shelf with two controls, uh, boost and cut. And if you use them uh, on the same shelf uh, so simultaneously, you end up with a boost in the very low end and then a cut just above that with very gentle slopes. And I just put that on these closed mic sources uh, to take out the proximity effect, but to restore uh, the this very sub low end that that the microphone doesn't have, to some extent. Fascinating! I mean, That's so cool. And and that gives you yeah uh, to me it gives you like big sounds without them being muddy. So it it I I thought of this just by going to uh, to orchestral uh, performances. Because people are so obsessed with uh, getting low end in check and it should be mono and it should be all instruments should cut off with high pass filters and you can only have bass there. And then you go to an orchestra hall, you hear the orchestra play and they have eight double basses <laughs> all playing at the same time. And yeah, and they're in a, an acoustic uh, situation where you hear a reverberation and, and especially in the sub lows and it gives you a massive, beautiful feeling. Yeah. So yeah why not i guess uh, and and yeah I, I mean sometimes it can be difficult and and sometimes instruments aren't meant to sound in in those very low frequencies and and you can bring up unneeded stuff then and sure high pass filter um but i make sure that in any mix i do that there's always a couple of elements that have that very extended uh feeling uh so so you can feel that you're in a a space and that everything has a particular size to it. So that's very cool. Well, so um, we're wrapping up near the end here, but I wanted to still give you a chance. I, I feel like you you kept talking about this busing with stems um, concept, and I wanted to give you a little bit more chance to elaborate on that. Um, we don't need to copy exactly what you do, but maybe help us understand how we might arrive at a busing with stems setup of our own. And would we do that in plugin world, for example? Um, you know, I'm used to the idea of bussing a bunch of drums together and they go through a drum bus. Um, you know, maybe there's a vocal bus that goes through a vocal bus. But it, when you describe it as different colors, it makes me think of these different areas that I might send any instrument to. And I wonder if you could just help us understand the concept a little more. Exactly. Um, 
I I based the concept of the the multi bus setup um, not necessarily on instruments, but on uh, places in the mix and and musical functions. So I make a division, and it's uh, three main core functions in any in any mix. So the rhythmic elements I, I call them like they're the edge of the painting, because rhythm sort of defines uh, a, uh, a space because it, it has a lot of room between the rhythmic elements where you can hear reverb decay. Mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, the um, percussiveness, uh, the, so the way that the sound is, um, is, is formed uh, leads to the sound having a lot of sub lows, uh, but also very high frequencies, these sharp transients. So usually the, the rhythm section is all, um, extended beyond all other elements in a mix. So that also uh, leads it to be the edge of the painting for me. So it sort of defines the dimensions of the mix in terms of space and in terms of the, the ends of the frequency spectrum. And then obviously there's the, still the, the time factor. So it also serves as, as a, a timekeeper. And what I want to do with uh, uh, a particular bus to house uh, rhythmic functions, uh, so that can be anything from drums, but also strummed and, and dampened guitar parts or, or very rhythmically played piano, something like that. They can all go to the rhythm bus. And what I want that bus to do is to extend the frequency spectrum. So it has to have big lows and big highs. And maybe what an off, uh, what, a, what a, a pitfall is of the, 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 the high peaks is that they can be a bit off-putting and too shrill. So I put a tape simulator on that bus and it just acts as, as the end stop for the rhythmic function. So it, it guards the edge of the painting, if you will. So uh, that, that's basically the rhythm bus. I, I tend not to touch it too much um, with compression because compression only makes the hits softer hmm. and I want loud hits on, on, on rhythm. So if I, I need to have a compressed drum sound, then I just create it in the source. Uh, so that, that goes before uh, the end bus, so to speak. Okay. And, and then the next bus would be um, you know, the musical wallpaper, if you will. So what goes in between these rhythmical uh, parts? And it, it's meant to dress up the painting. It's meant to uh, give color. Uh, but it's not meant to uh, clash with the rhythm parts, for instance. So I I put um, I, I saturate the high end uh, for those instruments quite a bit, so they they can't have bright transients, for instance. Uh, I have a device. It's it's a totally weird device, by the way, made by uh, Giraffe Audio from Denmark. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce its name. It's uh, Oh, well, okay. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm next to it now, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna try. It's the magnetodynamic infibidibulum, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, what it what it does is it it uh, it saturates a transformer, and you can uh, you can use different amounts of saturation on different uh, parts of the frequency spectrum. And for me, it acts like a, 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 a radical uh, form of tape simulation, also. Yeah. So that's basically something that that just uh, takes away all the edge for these sounds, and then I have like a very slow compressor on them, uh, just some something to emphasize sustain in the sound, because sustain is like a quality that that helps that sound fill up the mix more. And one thing I do is I don't have a drum bus compressor anymore, but I put the drum bus compressor uh, on well, the, the instruments meant to fill up the mix and I key it from the drum bus. So these instruments are ducked slightly uh, when there's loud drum hits. That's the, that, this is going with the musical wallpaper bus? Yeah, yeah. So the musical wallpaper is, is sort of ducked uh, slightly uh, by the, the rhythmical elements. And that keeps the compression off the rhythmical elements so they are al allowed to breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does allow me to uh, keep them relatively low in level because now a distinction in time is being made. So these other instruments are making room for the transient of the drums to to cut through. Or or you just feel it. You so you just your your brain picks up on that that um, <laughs> signal, you know, and says, "Oh, there's something going on there." I'm not sure. <laughs> um, something I wanted to point out, uh, so this is fantastic. Thank you for breaking this down. Something I wanted to point out, Rockstars, is that while Wessel says that there is no compression, 
on the rhythm bus, by the act of putting a tape simulator on there, there's a good chance that tape the tape simulator is doing what tape does, which is it actually limits. Um, it's a built-in soft tape limiting. So it is helping with those transients and the punch of things um, and probably allowing you to you know turn the, those rhythmic elements up a little bit. Exactly. And I also see it as a form of limiting that doesn't uh, shrink, uh, shrink in the sound. So if you have saturation on a transient, light saturation, because you, you don't want it to sound like bzz, bzz. Right. You want it to sound open. Uh, well, you haven't heard my mixes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this this light saturation just creates um, on any transient a, a harmonic uh, denser sound. So it makes these uh, transients sound more powerful, actually, while perhaps taking down the peak level a bit. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, that that's a beauty in tape that uh, you can get density uh, without uh, squashing things and without thinning things. Well, so, you know, I have a tape machine here at the studio and I've had the experience of recording a tracking session to tape going through the tape machine on its way into Pro Tools. And one of the first lessons I had to learn was aligning the tape machine in such a way that... Um, when I'm recording the band, we're listening to the tape machine and input, which means we're not hearing the tape yet, um, but we'll rewind the tape after the take and we'll play it in. And my levels going into Pro Tools always would clip in the red a little bit, and that was okay. And that's, in fact, what I needed them to do because the transient was going up and over the, the, you know, the limit of what Pro Tools could accept as an input when I was an input on the tape machine, but sure enough, when I rewound the tape and played it back, everything was nice and under control. So it was a really great visual way to learn and understand that experience. And I imagine with yours, if you can just simply bypass your tape simulator, you might see that same sort of visual indication of the levels shooting up over your, you know, what's okay, yeah. but once the tape's on, everything's nice and under control and compacted. Exactly. It's it's exactly that. And I also notice a difference in, in distance. So if I don't limit these very sharp peaks, and I'm talking, I, I do a lot of work with acoustic drummers, and then these um, peaks are just, um, they, they vary a bit more. If I were to do only work with samples, perhaps uh, I would use less of the saturation, but still it's a tempting uh, uh, treatment. And any what I no any tips is, for where you want to set the tape? Like, like if you have different options for your tape simulator, any tips there? Um, yeah. In other words, 30, uh, 30 uh, apps, 15, uh, anything like that? I, I put it at 15 because I value the low end too much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, at 30, it's it's gone too yeah. far for me. Yeah. So I, I want to emphasize as much as possible, but also the high end. So seven and a half. Uh, yeah. That's also not quite the zone for me, but yeah, it could, it could change per project, of course. Yeah. But uh, well, to be honest, mine is always at 50. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. Um, so you'd mentioned the rhythm bus and the musical wallpaper, and then how many more do you like to set up? Uh, well, then there's the foreground bus and, and, uh, that's just for, uh, uh, well, the protagonist in the play, basically. So that can be a vocalist, uh, but it can also be like a guitar solo or anything you need to feature in the foreground. And what you want to do with stuff that you feature in the foreground is um, it, obviously in terms of um, uh, spaciousness and, and perspective, it needs to be in the foreground. But um, something that coincides with that is that it should sound uh, well bright, basically. If so, if sound is is bright, then you associate it uh, with closeness. Um, so I I go for these uh, bright vocal sounds, but I don't want the mix to sound uh, tiresome or to have the vocal jump out uh, of the mix too much. Because then, um, if you hear such a jump in a mix, it sort of uh, shrinks every other instrument. And uh, I want to prevent that. So um, I have like this end zone, basically. It's the front of the painting and you can't go past it. So that's where I put the multiband compressor. Okay, cool. Uh, and it's uh, working only slightly, uh, but it allows me to mix a bit brighter on these uh, lead sounds, which sort of gives me a good feeling. I, I like to crank 
a bit of the high mid to get get the character in, in a vocal very audible, all the formants and, and the way uh, people pronounce uh, particular syllables. Uh, I want to make it very obvious. And then the multiband is just making it a bit more forgiving for me to do so. So if I go too far, it just takes down a bit of high end and, and it evens it out slightly. Super so this cool. is something yeah I found I, I, I used in almost any mix and then I just made a decision, you know, why, why not put it on uh, always? And, and then we get um, to the last bus. Uh, if it doesn't work, I have one bus that doesn't do anything. And it's just like a, a bypass bus uh, straight to uh, the master. Because I do have a, a master bus compressor on there as well. Um, so the, the, it's quite a lot of stages and it sounds maybe like a complicated thing. Uh, but all these things are doing very little. If you were to hear the effects of it, it, it maybe it would be a disappointment after this whole story. <laughs> uh, no, but, but we'd, be, we'd feel so proud of ourselves for setting it up. Yeah, yeah. It, you would feel good. <laughs> very cool. And the master bus is where you might put your master bus compression with yeah, a little bit of glue, you know. The, yeah, the, the the stuff that we talked about before, like like instruments influencing each other, I still want some of that uh, with with all the stuff combined. But by that time, I, I have the balance uh, smoothed out pretty much. And and maybe it's also good to to tell you that by using such a setup, I'm using way uh, less individual compressors than than uh, I think people that that mix without bus compression. Very cool. So. Uh, I just uh, I arrive at at similar dynamics at, at at the end, but the way I get there is is through these buses, and and it just helps gel everything together. So, quick question, a um, couple of quick questions. The um, four buses that you have going, um, which one might you send your effects to? Would they, if you have effects that accompany the lead vocal, would they just go to the same lead vocal bus, or would you send the effects directly to the bypass bus? Uh, depends on whether they're foreground or background effects. Okay, cool. So <laughs> if, yeah, yeah, I got, I got the system worked out. That's great. Uh, so all the background effects like reverb, uh, I don't want uh, compressors to work on that too much. And uh, I send them all to the bypass bus. And and that keeps, the for me, the the... The the distance to the background it keeps it nice and big, uh, so so I hear a lot of depth in in that uh, unprocessed bus. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, but if it's an effect like uh, put a, a fuzz or an octave or on a bass part, then then I just root it uh, in conjunction with the bass to to the same bus. Okay, cool. And then um, when you have particular instruments. Are you able to, do you choose one of these buses to route it to? So the drums, they're all coming together. Maybe they're in their own drum bus. And then that goes to number one, the rhythm bus. Or do you sometimes send it to more than one bus at the same time? Very rarely. Um, I, I, I do use the, the same setup uh, also in, in mastering for people. And, and sometimes when I work on material that has a lot of contrasts and, and sometimes, well, contradictions in it, then I use two buses at the same time because then I, I can use one to uh, mellow out all these uh, harsh transients and the other uh, to take um, to bring up um, the lower level detail and, and, and enhance the, low, uh, the high end in that. And then I, I just combine those. But that's a rare occasion. So um, cool. So cool. So, hey, I wanted to point out one other thing. When you were talking about the musical wallpaper bus, um, my thought when you talked about the uh, saturation and what it does for the high end is it seems like uh, it, it, by saturation it increases the harmonic content, which makes it where we perceive it as if we're hearing those instruments better without necessarily having to brighten them. And you described it as the reverse. You said it like kind of tones down that brightness. Yeah, it. Um, but this is like a very particular saturator. So it's not a thing that works full band. Uh, it's more like a tape machine where you would um, uh, increase uh, bias so that the high end saturates more than the other frequencies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it sort of mellows out the transients. 
so that's what what's happening. Uh, you don't hear a lot of uh, uh, distortion products. Actually, the thing sounds clean. That's why I can use it on a, on a grand piano as well. Uh, you wouldn't expect it. So, um, yeah, it's a subtle effect. It doesn't sound like a distortion box. That's it's cool. sort of like that's a cool. I, I would call it a sponge for That's high great. frequencies. I need more sponges in my mixes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Wessel, um, we've been talking good, going for a good couple hours, so it's time for us to wrap up. Um, uh, and I thought from our jam session questions, maybe I'd just jump to the final question for you, unless there's anything in particular I want to make sure we get to talk about. Um, but this, this one, one is hypothetical, and we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you get to go back in time and meet find young Wessel, um, maybe just sitting around, maybe you've just walked out of the mastering studio and you're in the coffee shop and you've been sitting listening all day and you go up and give you, give yourself some advice and you say, young Wessel, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself? Um, the, the, the advice I would give myself is, uh, learn to listen. Um, the, the the year I was talking about before where I was next to the mastering engineer mm -hmm. and just couldn't touch anything. I couldn't make <laughs> comments only when the clients left. Uh, I was just listening and trying to absorb everything and trying to grasp what was going on and what people were focusing on. Was that a and difficult first, year? Um, no, it was a year full of amazement, actually. Um, but you do have to be patient, uh, patient for it, I guess. But I was just, uh, it, it grabbed me, uh, the whole whole process of, of um, it, it taught me that, that um, anytime you make a recording, you represent a piece of music in a, in a new way and it changes it. You can't get around it. So even if you record in the most puristic way possible, so make a classical recording and try to capture reality, the whole act of putting up microphones and, and using a speaker system to represent it or headphones or anything, it changes the music. And and you need to get a grip on what these changes are and maybe even use the changes in your advantage because you can also do new things and, and help the music in a particular way with, with these changes. And yeah, you need to you need, you need to get a grip on on matters like that. And and that the only thing you can do is is listening. And and maybe watching somebody else uh, working, I, I felt that th that's the the thing that has most profoundly shaped me. And maybe um, read a book like Mixing with Impact, learning <laughs> to make musical choices. Oh yeah! Now that you mention it, that, now that, that I would also it. help. Yeah. So 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 cool, Wessel. Thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. It's been an absolute pleasure hanging out with you, and you have educated the crap out of me and given me some great, <laughs> great new insights into mixing. I really appreciate it. I also want to give a shout out to one of our rock stars who actually introduced me to you, Gavin Hart. So thank you, Gavin, so much for having introduced me to Wessel and, and uh, brought him on the show. And it's an extension to you, rock stars. If you believe there's somebody that would make a great valuable addition to the show, please feel free to email me at lidge at recordingstudiorockstars.com. Make the suggestion. And then, um, you know, if you're able to introduce me to that person, that always helps. Wessel, let the Rockstars know how they can find you. Where can they go find your book? Um, and is there anything else you want to let us know about? Um, I think they should just visit uh, mixingwithimpact.com. Uh, that has all the information you would need about the book. And you can also reach me uh, through that site. I love to get uh, feedback on uh, on people from people who read the book. Um, so yeah, uh, be in touch. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Uh, hopefully one day I'll be over in Holland again. It was many years ago. I was in Leiden and, and Amsterdam, and I really enjoyed it there. Um, and I uh, get to meet you in person. Yeah, I would love that. And I, I would show you that there's much more than tulips. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy, man. Well, um, Rockstars, a reminder to you, you can find links to what we're talking about in the show notes. Just go to rsrockstars.com, search for Wessel, W-E-S-S-E-L, -S -S -E take you right to the blog post. Or if you're on your mobile device, just click through right now. Um, you will also find the link to our YouTube playlist where Wessel has more videos where he's teaching you how to mix from his studio 
teaching you all kinds of insights. And uh, make sure to go pick up Mixing with Impact, learning to make musical choices. And Wessel, we'll see you around the studio, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Lidge. All right, groovy, dude. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.